So what is youth build then? Just kind of let's go back to the the, the origins. Yeah. Um, so youth build is a global NGO now. It started over forty five years ago in East Harlem, New York. Um, really, where our founder was working with young people on the streets of East Harlem, and she recognized that she could help them into work. But soon after, they were out again, which is a pattern we we see everywhere, right? So mm -hmm. she asked them, "Well, what would you want me to do if I could do anything to support you into sustained employment?" And they said, um, which was really profound actually they said we'd like to rebuild these derelict buildings and turn them into affordable housing because we don't have safe homes right um, and then what she did then kind of shaped who youth build is today and she said great make it happen you know like uh, make it happen because um, she recognized that they wanted to make a change and she recognized there was a role for her to play to get them to lead it rather than just make it happen for them. Mm. So she got them to lead it. And in that and through that process, um, obviously gave them the skill set, trained them up on the construction skills they needed to do it. And um, that's where Youth Build was born. So it was very much around giving young people the skill set, but also the mindset to lead. Mm. And that was over 45 years ago. We're now in 20 countries um, across the world. Um, and the UK is probably still the youngest of those. And I came across it in South Africa just a, a week or two before I left. Um, from a finance perspective, I had to look at the budgets, etc. for the Youth Build Academy that Sangoban was partnering with. Um, yeah, and met the team there and sort of said, look, I'm moving into a new role to do with training. Let's talk about the UK. And, yeah. So you actually, when you were working for Sangaban, bought Youth Build across to the UK? Yeah, I founded Youth Build in the UK. So, I mean, I just loved the model. It was around, you know, giving young people the agency to change their own lives. So mm -hmm. just love that. Um, but equally, it was very much demand led and brought industry into the delivery so that what was created and what was delivered was fit for purpose, was, you know, to the quality standards industry needed, etc. Yeah. So what's the size of it in the UK now? Um, we're still fairly, we're still local in London. So we run two, two set sites in London. Last year, we trained around 400 young people, um, but into construction, I would say about 100 a year. And where else <clears throat> are you training people if it's not in just in construction? So we have a program which is slightly shorter, which is more around just getting young people ready for work. So having many more options available to them. So typically digital, retail, hospitality and construction. Our construction program is very intensive. It's 13 weeks and 13 weeks of them turning up every day. But the but this program is a six to seven week program, which is really around exploring what the barriers they may face to long term employment are and helping them to overcome those but then also exploring what career options they want to actually mm. take and what pathways they'd like. So it's a lot more general. And then we spe we specialize on the construction side. Yeah. What would you say is the, the differences that exist in this country for youth getting into employment and having what you've mentioned is that agency, that ability yeah. to do what they want versus what it is in, in, in Harlem in the US? Um, I'm Surprisingly, the similarities are l much larger than the differences. I think what, I mean, I guess the similarities are the fact that young people don't have networks to access employment. Young people don't often believe in themselves or believe that those opportunities are even available to them. Um, that young people don't, um, yeah, they don't have this, the, the, the right level of support to help them overcome some of the barriers they face. Because mm. often we think about training in terms of skills and we're not always thinking about them as a holistic person and their life and what might be going on beneath the surface that needs to be addressed before they can stay in work. And that's why we see this pattern of them going in and out. But in terms of differences, I guess they're, they're, they're significant differences in the sense of in the US, you need to join a union before you move into construction. To join the union, you need to have a GED, so a high school diploma. So a youth build program in the U US is a year long to help them get that high school diploma. Whereas in the UK, the barriers to entry are much lower. Um, you know, anyone can go into construction as long as they've got the right attitude and they want to work hard, um, work hard and and just sort of build a career for themselves that the opportunities are there. Mm -hmm. So that's a big difference. Um, and I would say, I think, I don't know. I just feel I feel this, there are a lot of similarities, but I do feel that, yeah, we have less hoops to jump through in the UK, mm -hmm. you know, for, for young people to get through. Mm -hmm. Not not in the sense that young people face less barriers. They are definitely very similar to elsewhere in the world. And, and our programs need to really help and address that. But in terms of the industry itself, apart from getting the, the right card to work on site, you know, there isn't much more that a young person needs to have apart from the mindset. 
It's interesting that you mentioned yeah. about networks, and yeah. I was reflecting on this myself. You know, growing up, I was uh, I was brought up in a, a very deprived part of uh, of Bristol. Yeah, and my networks were really really narrow. Yeah. I didn't have anybody at all that's connected to the construction industry, especially outside of the, you know, putting one block on top of another or building a, a actual construction. If you look at designers or marketers or HR or any of those other types of mm. things that are connected, you know, not a chance did yeah, I yeah, yeah. have of, of connecting in that area. But one thing I did have is a is a stable home with a with a mum that was Darren, you can do anything. Yeah. So I did have that belief that I could do anything but I just didn't know what I didn't know. Sure of course and I think that's really important because you can have you, you know if you don't have the network that's one thing but on top of that if you don't have the support at home um, or the encouragement at home or people who actually even know how to build up your confidence you know because often we're working with young people who are carers in their home who are, who are the most responsible person in that home you know um, or young people who don't have that encouragement or who might not come from a stable family um, there definitely are a lot of young people we work with that have encouraging parents but again it's educating the parents in terms mm. of opportunities and options mm. for them mm. so yeah it's a it's a different world out there yeah. so how would someone come across youth build if i was a young person yeah say i was 15, 16 years old, I'm a carer, you know, mum yeah. is doing whatever, dad's doing whatever, but I'm, I'm caring. How, how would I come across you? Yeah, so we work with, I mean, one of our one of our principles is really to embed ourselves in the communities we work, you know, that we are very much connected at a very grassroots level. We really get to understand the needs because they're different from community to community. So I would say, you know, we're, we're very connected to all the service providers in an area. So one way would be through that. Route. We get referrals through those routes, but alternatively, you know, just reach out. Yeah. So those um, those service providers, are you talking kind of government, like social services, are you talking schools, are you talking youth yeah, clubs? The whole range. So whether it's youth offending teams, whether it's um, DWP, you know, in terms of job centres, um, care leaving teams, etc. So, yeah, all the local local um, authority services that are out there, but also private um, and the sort of third party services that are out there as well. So we try to work with um, third sector partners, you know, charities that are working frontline with young people. We try to work with government and their facilities for young people, et cetera. Um, but also just reach out with, through housing associations. Um, we often begin with the housing association because it's, it's their residents will be helping. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so yeah, it, I think outreach is really, really important because our goal is to, to reach as many young people as we can because we know that once we can get them to commit to working with us, we can help them. Why do they work with you? So often they come to us because they have to, which is, um, you know, it's a reality which we can't hide from. They come to us because their work coach says they've got to do some sort of training, etc. But, you know, why they work with us and stay with us, I believe, is because we genuinely care for them. We genuinely, our teams on the ground are working with them with genuine love and care for their future. Mm. And they see that instantly, I feel. I feel that they also will recognize that we see each one of them as an individual. You know, we're not uh, we're not about boxing people into groups or, or looking at them as a whole. We really are about meeting each individual where they're at mm. and understanding their own journey and, and understanding where they want to get to. Um, so I think the uniqueness of what we offer is that it is very much about each individual that comes through our doors. Um, and, and each one of their journey will look slightly different whilst they go through the same course. Um, but also, and very importantly, they build community very quickly at Youth Build. Um, a big part of Youth Build is, commun is community and, and helping young people connect with their communities, but also with each other. Um, so they instantly start to build that support network amongst themselves and amongst their, their, the team around them. What yeah. types of things do you do to foster that community? Oh, so many things. I mean, uh, the first thing is just, um, like I said, meeting each individual where they are. So, you know, tr building trust initially. You know, the minute they walk in our door, we celebrate them. We, we, we clap them in because they've made a step through, which, you know, it's a big thing. It's a big thing to make a decision to turn up at nine o'clock you know, on a Monday morning or a Tuesday morning to come. What, what are those yeah. reactions like? Because I can imagine that you would get some 
quite extreme in, in, in both ends. One embarrassment, one of like, <laughs> yes, I've, There's I've a been lot. recognized. A hundred percent, hundred percent. There are different reactions to it. And I think almost it's, it's just unexpected. Uh, but instantly after that, we all sit in a circle together. Okay. Right. And we, we introduce ourselves, each one of us an equal, you know, just saying who we are, but also how we're feeling that day. One word to describe how we're feeling. So it just helps people recognize that this is, this is a place where we will be heard, where our voice will matter. Mm. You know, we're in this circle of trust. Mm. Um, and that circle of trust continues throughout the program. Mm. We have that every morning, um, really as a means to reconnect and for staff to check in. Um, but also, you know, there's a lot of intentional um, creativity throughout the program, which which really helps build that community. So we we're developing young people to build the competencies that will enable them to lead in whatever that means to them. You know, so whether that's being a good listener or team player or communicator, but also whether that's about managing your emotions, managing your finances, you know, resilience um, as far as sort of nutrition and hygiene and being able to cook for yourself. So all of these things are really looking at the person as a whole, but also how they interact with those around them. And we have what we call mental toughness at Youth Build, which is the which is prior to them joining the program. So it's like a pre-selection. Um, but more importantly, it's a chance for them to see whether this is for them and whether they're willing to make that commitment. Um, so I think that is where a lot of that community is built because mental toughness is about team building. It is about social interactions and mm. and just taking people out of their comfort zones without them even realizing it. Yeah. What types of businesses do you work with that um, open up uh, job positions and, and, and give these young people employment that you've been working with? Yeah, so a whole range. I mean, you know, from construction SMEs to um, tier one contractors that have social value commitments in local areas. Um, so a whole range of um, of partners that have been, we've been working with throughout the years, you know, because one thing we promised at Youth Build is we wouldn't put a young person in front of a partner, an employer, if we didn't feel they were ready for it. Obviously, we can never guarantee that. Mm. But we go through quite a rigorous process of supporting the young person to be ready for the world of work, but also then checking in with them to see that they are, you know. So we've got a strong network of partners, but obviously never never enough to take on all the young people that we'd like. So, yeah, from tier ones right through the chain, um, like I said, housing associations, developers, clients who who may have so so one of our one of the examples is we work with Peabody who um, are the major landowners in Thamesmead which is where one of our sites are so f through them we work with their supply chain that you know anyone that is part of that development they've got a 40 year what's well, not 40 years now but there was a 40 year regeneration program for the area mm. um, and their priority was really that local young people get access to those jobs um, and we were able to then help them with that uh, by reaching people locally and training them to be able to access the work. So if you were to pitch to somebody that's got a business in an area that you cover that currently isn't connected with youth build, what would what would you say? What would your pitch be to them? I mean, I would I would say that, you know, we know that there's a profound skill shortage in construction, but equally we know that there's one in eight young people that are out of work and out of education, right? So what we offer is that intersection between the two. Um, and, and the reassurance to a construction employer is that we, we work very hard on both the mindset and the skill set for young people so that we, you know, we're working to get them ready for the world of work of construction. We get, we're working to get them to really understand what that means, but not through ourselves, but through employers' eyes. And, mm -hmm. and we have a lot of, um, we have a lot of opportunity for employers to come in and engage with sessions and enrich the learning of the young people. We have opportunity for employers to offer them site visits and take them out to to actually see what the world of work is like. Um, so it's a very realistic view of what construction entails, what the culture of the industry is like, etc. Because they're hearing it straight from young people. Um, so what we can what we can offer an employer is that we've taken them through. You know, we we intensely invest in each individual so that they're more ready for the world of work. One, because we want the individuals to succeed, we want them to transform their lives and we want them to stay in work and, and not just get a job, but actually build a career. Mm -hmm. um, but equally, we understand that the only way for us to achieve that in the long term is to build credibility with employers. Mm -hmm. You know, so actually making, making sure that the ambassadors we send out there are representing mm -hmm. the young people of the future mm -hmm. so that the employers come back for more. How is it that you go from finance to where you are at the moment? 
years you know so i'm i'm wondering yeah. what what childhood was like for you and and what yeah where where this is where this has come from uh it's not it's not that complex a, a question because it came it comes from my dad um you know we were a family of four girls and one boy um we lived in a very rural part of zambia and my father left his own education at the age of about 14 to then work and put his younger siblings through so for him he saw he understood firsthand the value of education and put us through the best he could offer us um you know we all all of us went abroad we had a very very fortunate um a lot of support from our dad in terms of our own education and for him you know despite all the challenges he faced from family and friends around why are you educating your daughters why are you sending them abroad he stood by his belief that it was as important or more important to educate us mm. than it was anyone else and i just know from throughout my life that my dad you know he was always a sounding board for any choices i had to make he you know he, although he didn't open up as many networks to me because he didn't have them from a work perspective he was in a very different field he definitely gave me the confidence i needed to to go and pursue that myself and i think i just realized throughout my life because of living in rural zambia that it was a real privilege and it was something i didn't take for granted you know and and recognizing that around me there were women particularly girls and that that were just never given these options um and simply in in those parts of the world because they were female you know the sons would be sent to university or the sons would be sent to high school because obviously at that point you had to pay um the choice was always that the women wouldn't mm. pursue that you know so for me there it was this injustice was brewing in me from a young age i did a lot of work with my dad he was he was in politics at the time i did a lot of work with him to try and promote equality through education in everything you know he did and throughout my life it was something i worked with in the background you know despite being in finance i um did a lot of work with young young people in zambia did did work with young women particularly in zambia to help them into tertiary education mm. um because i felt like there was a lot in place to help young people through school in terms of other charities and other support but it was that next step to really excel and build a career that wasn't always there and so when it came to the when i was coming to the end of my career in south africa with sangoban and we had made a decision to move back to the uk for family reasons i um yeah i just thought out i thought out pursue my real purpose in terms of supporting um underserved communities and helping you know just this feeling that everybody deserves a good day at work right and everybody deserves choice um and not everyone has it um because sometimes you're a victim of your circumstances and and getting beyond that is not so easy without the right support yeah and and sangoban was incredible they supported the journey yeah. so it sounds like you you're actually fulfilling or were working on your passion at the moment Oh yeah, 100%. I mean, uh, nothing drives me more than seeing, you know, the transformation in a young person's life. I think it's uh like I said, it's just recognizing that you can form those networks for them. You can help them overcome the barriers that they face. And, you know, we see we see the most loyal employees come out of young people that have come through programs, right? Um young people that are really willing to work hard for you and willing to recognize that you've given them that chance and that choice. So yeah, definitely it, it it's what wakes me up every day. And what's the future for Youth Build? Future for Youth Build is, you know, we've we we've run a great program. We know we do. Our mm. success rate is huge. We have we're placing at least 75% of the young people into work after a program um within a month or so of program. So the future of Youth Build is just doing a lot more of what we're doing. So, you know, building more partnerships across the country to enable us to reach more young people that's the goal and and just broadening our net in terms of what we actually do to support young people so what do you need from that i'm just thinking if there's someone that's listening to this podcast at the moment saying i've i've googled youth build and i love what you're doing yeah how how can they facilitate what 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 would you need who who do you need to help facilitate sure. your your growth plans and your ambitions So it's quite simple in our world. I think, you know, we have proof of concept, we're ready to scale. We're looking for the right partners who share our ethos in terms of um a genuine belief in the in in high aspirations of young people. Um, you know, a belief that there isn't a limitation to what they can achieve and a belief that, you know, they deserve a a bright future basically. So that that's the first thing. 
just, you know, that love and care for young people in terms of partnerships. But then obviously it goes without saying that the funding element is a big part of it too. So, you know, um, working with partners or local authorities or government that that are willing to fund our work because they know it works, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, in the US, Youth Build, um, you know, after 22 years of operation is now government funded. You know, there is a Youth Build Act in Congress and there's a Youth Build Grant that partners can apply for and to run a Youth Build program. And I mean, ultimately in the UK, we recognize that, yeah, we just want to get out there and reach young people. But but really through partners that are based in local areas, we're not we're not necessarily looking to go and set up ourselves in every area around the country, but really to to work with partners to enable them to deliver the youth build program. So you're looking for other people in other areas of the country to yeah. come and say, "Hey, we want like to set to up yeah. my own version." Yeah. And, and what does that look like? What uh, what process would someone need to go through to to do that? Um, just a conversation with us, really, and I think we would then work through a process together of determining what the need is. Because, like I said. We, we never assume that we know what a local area requires and what the young people in that area require. Mm. So typically what we would do is really try to try to bring young people from that area together to understand what their needs are and what the current provision is providing, where, the, where there may be gaps, if any. Um, but then also bring community partners together to understand what that collaboration might look like. Um, like I said before, it's very important that youth build is embedded in the community. So really understanding what all the stakeholders require, um, and you know, and lastly, ensuring there is a pipeline of employment, um, which is critical to to its success. Because we're not about training young people for the sake of it. It's really about sustained livelihoods. Um, so bringing employers around the table to really understand what that pipeline looks like, what the training should look like, and co-designing with young people, communities, and employers what a youth build program should look like in that area. That's good. And what's um you, you mentioned that you've got um seventy five percent yeah of of people placed into uh, in work. What about those other fifteen percent that don't quite make it? What happens to them? Really good question. So about. Three years ago now, we launched a social enterprise called Youth Builders um, really to address that because what we realized is, you know, we make a promise to young people that we want Youth Build to be the last intervention that they would require. Yeah. And we really stand by that. We want young people to come through a program and continue to be supported by us or move into employment and continue to get that in-work support. But we recognize that once we begin another program, it's quite difficult to provide the level of support that those people still need to then move into work. Um, so we launched Youth Builders, which is a which is a social enterprise that works with our housing partners mm. to to get on normal co supplier terms their contracts to turn around their void properties, for example. And through that, we employ the young people that haven't gone into work, mm. but use the opportunity to continue coaching them and developing them until they're ready for. Um, to transition into employment. Mm. So Youth Builders kind of helps us with those that haven't directly moved in. One, because they don't feel they don't feel they've they've not achieved at the end of program because they're still going into work, they're still being paid. Um, because what we wouldn't want is that they come to the end and some have gone into work and others haven't and they're feeling, mm. you know, disheartened by that process. So mm. we really try to, I mean, obviously we're not able to take everyone on to Youth Builders, but we try to do what we can. Um, and that support and you know, their journey continues within an employed space where they then move on to permanent employment. But also it's just about understanding, like I said, each one is an individual. So why are they not, why have they not moved into work? Is it a choice? Is it family? You know, we've had young people who might have had to be taken, might have been taking care of a parent, for example, who's ill. So whilst they were really great and, and got into jobs, they couldn't maintain them. Um, so it's understanding each individual and understanding that actually we need to we need to tailor their plan after youth build graduation so that we help them into work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, even if it takes a year after, we're still there for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but I think what's very important for us is that we can't do this alone. You know, it is about it is a collective. It is about a collective with a young person at the heart of it, you know, and, and how we how we bring together all the right partners to extend our circle of control because we're not able to mm. to provide a young person with everything that they need all the time, you know, um, whether that's in the workplace or actually getting employers on board that are 
that are willing to continue that support for young people once they're in the, in mm. in work, you know, because I think there's nothing worse than us supporting a young person into work and all that support just falls away once they're there. Um, and we understand it. I mean, you know, contractors are not there to, to continue the level of support mm. we have. Mm. But I think it's just it's just a mindset shift in terms of young people require a different level of support today, you know, than we might have many, many years ago. And and that whole concept of it's always been done this, this way doesn't always work now. You know, you've got to understand your audience and who you're working with. So I think, you know, it's a whole collection of community partners that are coming together to support a young person, teams within Youth Build that are, that are genuinely um, dedicated to this young person, but equally employers after who are willing to continue that support. Yeah. What would you say that the major barriers are that exist for young people at the moment? To to move into employment. To move um, into employment. And and maybe I would extend the question as well just to say to challenges, challenges that exist now general. for young people, but that didn't when, when you were younger. Yeah, yeah. I think, I mean, a lot of them probably existed, you know, in the past, but I would say mental health is a really big one. And then, like I mentioned before, that access to a network, you know, and... Um, and also just the the educational process. You know, a lot of a lot of young people we work with have either left school or or didn't succeed in a in a formal educational environment because there isn't the time within there to really tailor the learning to what the needs are of each young person. So I think that that also is a challenge and and just societal challenges that we know young people face today. So um, crime, you know, risk, you know, poverty. Um, the general challenges that we know are a big part of our society today, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I think for young people today, the access to a network, having a support network around them that isn't just about getting into work, but that is about believing in them and showing them the right way or or wanting them to excel and do better. Uh, we come across many challenges where, where that isn't the case, you know, where there's generations of of lower aspirations and not really not really enough push to kind of say let's let's try and transform our lives you know you only know what you know yeah and with the benefit of hindsight when you're older you can understand how a network a good strong network can lead you to not just a, a concept of success yeah but can also help you overcome difficulties and challenges and open doors for you as well as closed doors because some doors you don't want open <laughs> yeah yeah but when if you're 14 15 how would you ex how would you articulate or, or, or explain that to a 14 15 year old yeah the, the power of a network it's a challenge because like you say you don't know what you don't know right and i think i think it is about exposure and options you know it's about it's about showing them that a network of support could be there for you through, you know, through this part of your journey where you're trying to overcome some challenges or where you're trying to move away from things that you might be involved in. But it can also open up doors for you to to different avenues you might not have considered. So it is about choice and it is about options and networks are there to to help you discover those. Right. So I think it's always a challenge because one, you know, even having a conversation about a network is much later down the line. First of all, it's about, you know, it's about you as an individual and you taking responsibility for yourself, right? Mm -hmm. So at Youth Build, we always talk about leadership. And to us, leadership means, you know, taking responsibility for yourself, taking responsibility for those immediately around you, and then taking responsibility for your community. So it is a journey. So even before you can think about network, it's about you as an individual and, you know, just understanding what you need to do to just be responsible for yourself and make that mm -hmm. make that change and, and almost have a conversation with yourself that you want to do that, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. because Youth Build isn't for everyone. It isn't for people who have not yet decided to make that change. You know, we're still there for them and we'll work, walk with them on that journey. But to commit to a program, you, you've got to have decided you want to do that, mm -hmm. you know. And, and that doesn't mean that you need to know the answers or you need to transform immediately. It means that you're willing to travel the journey with, with Youth Build, right, um, and other partners. So I think it's a tough one to describe a network on its own because it will be very, uh, uh, it's intimidating to begin with, right? Like I'm not even comfortable in a room with two people 
why would I want to be with others, right? Mm -hmm. So I think what's really important is recognizing the journey of a young person and being very intentional about when things are introduced and how things are introduced. And almost just really, for us, it's about building competencies that almost become second nature, but are not very obvious up front, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. So thinking about mental health, yeah. what is it that I can do if I'm surrounded with young people, either because I'm a parent or there are young people that work in my organization? What is it that I can do to foster a positive and a good mental framework and mental yeah. health within young people? Yeah. I think the biggest thing is just being real, you know, just being real, being there and listening. Um, you know, not I think often with mental health, we always want to have an answer and, an, and a response. But sometimes all you all you need is just for someone to be there and to listen, you know, and to know that if you need them, they're there. Um, so I think that would be first and foremost. But then also recognizing that you don't have all the answers despite all your experience, you know, like often, particularly in construction, we manage behavior on what we see and what, what is displayed. We don't really go deeper and understand cause, right? So, you know, and and I understand why and I understand there are limitations in terms of what's tolerant on what's tolerable on site, etc. But, you know, if a young person is late consistently, they're marked down for being late, which again impacts their mental health even further, right? But how often do we actually sit down and have a restorative conversation around why are you late and what can we do to help? Do you know, mm -hmm. do we even know if they had a bed to sleep in that night? Do you know, and it's that sort of thing where it's about really getting, really understanding the person that you're working with or that is in with your, within your organization. But, but just recognizing that sometimes they just need to know that you're there. Yeah. And for some people, that's quite difficult to imagine because if I've got a bed to sleep in at night, then I assume that everybody does. Yeah. And the person that I'm working with, of course, they've got a bed to sleep in at night. But the framework that I'm approaching that from is my own. Exactly. I've got a bed to sleep in at night, so yeah. that means that you do. Yeah, exactly. And that's why I say, like, you know, just remove the assumptions, the perception of what you think it might be, mm. and just listen. Because I think the biggest thing with young people and mental health is being able to, is, is for you, for us to build trust, right? And for them to feel they're not being judged, they're not being, you know, that they're not having solutions thrown at them that actually don't make sense to them. And it is about having the right level of support and knowing as well when to escalate and when to get them additional support if you're not able to manage it, um, which is what we do at Youth Build all the time because we're not counselors, we're not there to, to really support um, where the needs are greater. So I think it's recognizing where that is and when extra support and more more sort of clinical support might be needed. But other than that, it's very much around um, not making any of those assumptions and just being really real with them and listening. Yeah. How do you ensure that standards are kept, but at the same time being curious enough and being open enough to be able to support somebody? Yeah. Because there is a limit to what is acceptable and what isn't acceptable. And like you said, you're not yeah. there as as um, as therapists or as no. social workers or, uh, or or anything like that, but how, how do you how do you approach that? Yeah, I think it's um I think in any organisation, including Youth Build, it's understanding what those standards are and what the fundamentals are that make the program a success or mm. make the workplace a success or you know prevent any risk, etc. Um, and it's understanding how you articulate those and bring people on a journey with you to understand those, right? Because we're never, we're never saying, you know, relax the health and safety rules because we need to give young people more time to grow. I think they need to understand the importance of those up front, but it's about how you communicate to them and how you take them on a journey to understand why things are important mm. um, and not just assume they'll get it the way you might have, you know? Mm. Um, and I think that's what we do at Youth Build. We have elements of our program that are essential to their journey. Um, you know, the elements that, you know, might be exciting, might not be, but they are important because we've planned this journey intentionally based on based on what we've seen from previous young people, based on feedback, but based also on what we, you know, we, we know their development needs to look like. So I think understanding what those fundamentals are, those non-negotiables, if you want to call it that, and, and making sure young people are aware of the why behind them mm -hmm. 
is really important because often, you know, we rules are rules, but if you don't really know what they mean or why they're in place, um, it's difficult. So as an example, at Youth Build, we, you know, on day one, I think it is, we have what we call a respect agreement, which is, so rather than us standing in front of the group of, of youth partners that come through, we we get them to work in groups and we talk about, you know, what would you, what are your expectations of yourselves mm -hmm. and of those around you? And they come up with a respect agreement that is pretty much what most people would stand up and tell them the rules of the center are. But because they've come up with it themselves, they've thought through it, they've understood that that's what they want to succeed. It just means a lot more, it means a lot more to them. So I think bringing young people on the journey with you is important. They, they're not, they're not, I guess, as passive in terms of how they receive things anymore. They want to know why, they want to understand the value. Yeah. It's interesting that you've mentioned that and you also use the word youth partners. Yeah. Yeah. And so already there there is even in the language the the connection and the leveling up of of Definitely. respect and that you're joining with them to help them go in a direction that they want to go in. Definitely. Definitely. Language is critical and and language really shapes you know our behaviors, right? So for us they are youth partners, we are equal, we do sit in the circle together. Um, you know, as much as we can, we involve them in decision making, etc. And it is it is a really important part of their journey to recognize their value. You know, they're not just there to be told what to do. They can create it. They can shape it. Um, they can, you know, contribute to it. And I think that's a very, yeah, it's a critical part of who we are. You know, just really recognizing that they are partners on the journey with us. It's not just about us dictating what that journey looks like. What would you say that you have learned from this experience that you've had with Youth Build to date? That's a big question. I, I, I think the biggest thing is the power of love, like in all honesty, you know, just genuine love and being able to and not shy away from showing that to young people. You know, we might think they don't want that. We might think they don't know how to handle it, but actually they do and they want it. And you know, love might look different for different people, but I think very much it is the power of love amongst the team, amongst um, the young people and, and employers too, you know, just really, really recognizing that we're there to serve them as well. So love is something that is threaded throughout Youth Build. It's one of our core values as an organization. And I think that is the one thing I would say I feel strongly about and I've learned more about through my time at Youth Build. Um, because it is the it's the cornerstone of everything we do, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but aside from that, I I don't know. There's a lot of things. I think on one hand, yeah, on one hand, it's it's being very intentional. It's about being very intentional. So you know, not not running programs for youth partners that are standard, but re reading the room, recognizing what their needs are, recognizing that each group that comes in is individual, and they might their journey might look different. Um, I've also learned a lot about communication and being clear in terms of expectations, particularly from employers. So recognizing that, you know, it's important for us to communicate uh, the needs of a young person to employers before they come and engage with us or when, an, when a young person's moving into work. But also about withholding, um, you know, having, having high standards and high expectations for them too. So, you know, we would be we would be quite selective in terms of which employers we work with. For us, it isn't about ticking boxes. It isn't about getting young people into any job. It is about long-term success and long-term community building and transformation, right, of, of society. So young people succeeding and building careers is what we ultimately want. So having employers that pay well, that look after their staff, that actually value young people in the workplace is what we look for. And yeah, that that's been a learning too because it isn't about accepting every job that comes your way in addition to that you know just the whole world of nonprofits. it's a lonely place lonely it, yeah it's lonely i mean you know you come from a corporate world like sangoban where you've got marketing department you've got a hr department you've got an it department and you've got lots you you know, it's probably different for you because you've started up your business. But for me, it was a big, big change, mm -hmm. you know, moving into a place where you wear all those hats mm -hmm. and everyone turns to you for solutions on on elements you might not even have the answer to, but you've got to go and learn it, you know, or lean on someone that can help you do it. So it's been it's been a journey, but it's been great. I would never turn back the clock. You know, I would never regret what I'm doing or turn it back and anything. I'd do it again and again. But um, but yeah, it's been interesting. <laughs> 
I love that. Thanks yeah. for sharing those lessons. I just wanted to kind of hone in on one of the things, yeah. which was the first thing that you mentioned, which was love. Yeah. And I think that, and the reason I, the reason that this intrigues me is because often in the English language, the word love gets misconstrued. And I think that that's only because there is only word, one word for love, yeah. whether that's the love that you have for your, your partner or husband or wife yeah. or the, the love that you have for your children to the love that you have for a hobby. The word love is the same. And there are lots of other languages in the world where the, the word changes sure. and shifts. Sure. And so what, what do you mean when you, when you say that, um, that love is important? What, what does that look like and what does that feel like for, for, for the young people that you work with from your point of view? I think in its simplest form and a simple definition would be purity of intention. You know, you're there not for any other reason but for their success. And, you know, that genuine belief that they can do it if they have the right support. Mm -hmm. So it's taking away any stereotypes, any sort of preconceived ideas, and it's genuinely dedicating yourself to those individuals, right, because you believe in them. And a love for the work, but a love for the people, too, that come through, mm -hmm. you know. So, yeah, I think it is very much about its purity, really. It's about not muddying the waters with, you know, we've got to deliver X and our results have to be this. And yes, we have to we have to think about our results because that's how we, we're funded, right? But ultimately, it is about recognizing that we need to stand up for the journey and the people that we're working with. And that, that has to come from love because it, it can't come from, it's not motivated by much else, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. That's wonderful. The way that you've articulated that is is so right because we can approach any situation with a hidden agenda. Yeah. And sometimes the agenda is so hidden that we don't even recognize it ourselves. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And especially in our world, you know, where, where a lot of what we do is driven by funding, driven by targets, driven by KPIs that are, you know, that are limiting. Mm -hmm. And for us at Youth Build, it's recognizing that if we were to run our organization with that alone, we wouldn't be able to do the work we do. So a lot of what we do has always got to be mm. deeper and supplemented by by partners so that we're able to deliver a much more intensive investment in each individual. From the experiences that you've had at Youth Build, what's been the story that's put the biggest smile on your face? They're, honestly, there are too many. There are really too many. I mean, I just have to think about young people that come through and I mean, there's one, one of our youth partners came to us and for his first two, three days, he had his hood on and wouldn't engage, you know, was hiding from everyone around him. And just you could feel that there was little trust and there was just, you know, didn't want to be, didn't want to be there, had to be there. And slowly we started seeing him connect with others and start building a bit more confidence in conversation, etc. And... Uh, you know, it turns out that this youth partner was dealing drugs at the, from the age of 13, only to put food on his mom's table, um, was used to hiding from everyone, you know, because he didn't want his mom to know he's doing this as well, you know, and then came through our program, realized that, hey, this is different. People actually care. And, you know, it isn't just they aren't just here to kind of put me through a process or whatever. Twelve weeks later, gave a speech at graduation, moved into an apprenticeship, still working, you know. Um, even that, like, didn't didn't pass his CSCS card on program, so came back after whilst he was in employment because obviously the employer needed this for him to continue. Came back again, going back to I can't do this. I've always failed at everything I've done. I'm not going to pass, and just kind of being there to boost his confidence and say, look, you've come so far. You can do this. And getting that call from him when he passed, um, getting to see his first paycheck that was that he could give his mum, that was earned legitimately and, you know, and uh, yeah, just that's one story of many that are, that just sticks with me. And I mean, it's just, it's just incredible to know that with, with love and with people around you that genuinely care, you can, you know, young people and youth partners can completely transform their lives. And I think um, it's what keeps me going every day, you know, just the, these stories and, the, and, you know, every, we've just had a new group start now and, and even there, I know there will be, you know, equally powerful stories because yeah our young people in, endure a lot today in today's world you know they really do and this is our this is their way out and we really wish we could reach all of them through youth what you're doing is literally changing <laughs> the world and i yeah. really just love to hear 
the stories that that you're recounting here and I think that you can always tell the intent and quality of a person by the way that they focus on or are able to focus on those yeah. younger people and those rising generation because everything that we do eventually we're going to hand on to 100%. someone that's that's younger than us that's that's coming through and so yeah. I see that from listening to the experience that you've had with your father yeah and we've not spoken about it on the podcast but privately we've we've spoken about you know your your own uh, family, children yeah, and yeah. your own family and and it's it's great for for me to hear that that you're doing that with youth build as well and, and yeah. to see the passion there no it's fantastic i mean i i love it Shanaz, i've loved having you on the podcast today before we finish is there anything that we haven't discussed that you think Oh, let's let's talk about this. Or is there anything that you haven't said that you want to say? I think I think the only thing I would say is, you know, is what we do works, right? So the more we can do it, the better for young people. Um, but also, I would say to you, have a young person in my place here, and hear firsthand from them, you know, what what the power of support and networks and uh, genuine belief in their potential can do for them. You know, in construction, we always talk about the skill shortage. We've been talking about it for so many years. But there are a lot of a lot of young people out there that given the right support can mm. can sort of come into the industry. They they do want to work in the industry. They don't often know how to get there. And when they are there, they don't know how to stay because of the culture and the support around them. So I think, you know, listen let's listen to young people a lot more than we do now. At Youth Build we always say like we can't have a conversation about young people without them at the table right and i i've seen it over and over again within construction forums where we're talking about a skill shortage and there's very rarely a young person around the table so that's probably the one thing i would say 